Hello and welcome. You're listening to a Davin and Players podcast. May and June 2020 were all set to bring two ambitious productions to Davin and Theatre. A night of radio plays and sketches and a night of new writing as part of the Northwich Lit Fest. Like many things across the world during 2020, these two events had to be postponed until further notice. But the group from the radio production continued to meet most weeks online and the monthly writers group continued to develop their new writing. The two groups decided to combine their efforts and produce their very own podcast of original material, or so they hoped, having never done anything like this before. So, for the last six months, the group nicknamed themselves Davin and Radio Players. We're very proud to present... Davin and Radio Players, live from lockdown. There are four episodes in the series, all of which can be enjoyed individually in any order you like. Every word spoken has been written and performed by members of Davin and Players. For those who are regular to our theatre, you have no idea how good it is to have you back. And to those who are new to us, it's great to meet you. We did it. And now, it's time to share it with you. We hope you all enjoy yourselves. Right then. Got your torch on your phone ready, Josh. Shine it on that cupboard again, would you? Yep. Ha <laughs> ha. I wonder what they'd do if they like knew we were messing around in their theatre. Ha <laughs> ha. My mum is acting sus. Mine didn't have a clue I was out last night. <laughs> Aha! I remember my gran and her mate are in this one. What's it called again? Oh yeah, Strike Three. Should we play it? Strike Three. Written by Catherine Lamb. Performed by Vanessa Duffy and Jackie Buckley. At the third stroke, it will be at the third stroke. It will be at the third stroke. At the third stroke, it will be. It will be. Morning, Jessie. How are your feet? Oh, don't ask, Annie. I'm a martyr to these bunions. They're getting so big, I'll be setting a place for them at the tea table soon. <laughs> it's a good job I can sit down for the next few hours. I prefer this early shift. I were on late so last week. Nothing but a load of drunks thinking it's hilarious to ring up five times in a minute to try and put you off. Yeah, I hope it's quiet. I might get a head start on that cardi I'm knitting for our Janet's baby. Mind you... It's an ugly little thing. The sort of kid you hope will grow into its looks. Rather like a, at the third stroke, it will be 8, 42 and 20 seconds. Pip, 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 pig in a dress. Bless. Probably doesn't help that it's, well, you know, a bit different. What? Ginger? I know. Could be worse, I suppose. It could be... From Yorkshire. God forbid. I wish our Albert would show some signs of settling down and making me a gran. I don't think he's ever even had a girlfriend. Seems to spend all his time down that snooker hall with his mate of his, Jason, with a long hair and tight. At the third stroke, it will be 8.43 and 50 seconds. Bip, bip, bip. Bell bottoms. Still... I suppose he's young. There's plenty of time for him to find love. Er, uh, maybe he already has. What? And not told me? No. We're very close, me and Albert. He tells me everything. I don't think any 19-year-old boy tells his mum everything, Annie. At the third stroke, it will be 8.55, precisely. Bip, bip, bip. 8.55? Do you need to clean your glasses, Jessie? It's 8.45. I know. I'm not going do Lally yet. That was Mrs Johnson from number nine. She's always late for everything. And she's got a doctor's appointment this morning. 
and you know what a sour mare that receptionist can be if you're late. So I added ten minutes on for her. Oh, you didn't. You'll get the sack from Mr Aldsworth if he finds out. How is he going to find out? Anyway, it's harmless. I'm just helping people, looking out for them. Do you do it a lot, then? Change the... At the third stroke, it will be 8.46 and 10 seconds. Bip! 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 Time, I mean. Not that much, Annie. Just when I think someone needs a hand. For example, for the old folk what ring, I talk a bit slower so they can take it in. Otherwise, they keep having to ring back. And it's tuppence ago. It's not fair. Right. Well, when you put it like that, and I suppose it won't matter after this month. Oh, you're right there, Annie. End of an era. Job for life, my old dad called this when I got it. He was so proud and chuffed to bits that those elocution lessons he paid for turned out to be worth it. Jessie, my girl, he'd say, everyone will always want to know the time because no one's ever got enough of it. He'd be right sad to know that we're being replaced by... At the third stroke, it will be nine, thirteen and thirty seconds. Bip, bip, bip. A bloody machine... I oh, know. Well, I'm gone. Nine thirteen. That's half an hour fast. I know. That was Mr. Stevens from Culshaw Road. He's having an affair and he's checking the time to see if his wife's gone to work so he can come back home and roll around on the candle wick with his fancy piece. Dirty dog. Dog? <laughs> That's funny. His mother in law's coming to let their dog out this morning. And I don't think Mr Stevens will be wagging his tail if Enid Jackson catches him cheating on her, Violet. Bloody hell, Jessie. How do you know all this stuff about people? Are you some kind of spy? <laughs> no, but I reckon I could have been. I do two days a week at the exchange, remember? Oh, and you get to hear a lot of interesting stuff on them party lines. Don't you feel guilty for listening into people's private conversations? No. Anyway, it's a public service. I'm just looking after my neighbours, like we did in the war. By eavesdropping on them? Hey, I only use it to help people. Believe you me, Annie, there's stuff I could tell you that'd make your ears bleed. And I keep it all to myself. Never gossip me. Not like that Mrs Hardwick from Sycamore Terrace. No better than she should be, that one. Neck curtains and no knickers. What'll you do when this place closes down, then? You'll not survive on two days' wages. Not with your Billy being on... At the third stroke, it will be 8.52 and 40 seconds. Bip! 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 Sick that last year. I'll be fine, Annie. I've got a transfer to directory inquiries. That'll never be replaced by a bloody machine. What about your... Public service. I've still got two shifts at the exchange. I might not be able to change the time any more, but a few wrong leads and a few wrong sockets and all sorts of stuff can be sorted out. What, will you just give up then? I know you don't need the money, what with your Arthur being management. Not sure. Albert wants to go to London with Jason, share a flat and get a job in one of them new boutiques. So he might need me to go and stay with him for a bit, help him settle in. Hmm, maybe. Anyway, we'll still see each other, won't we? Bingo, every other Thursday. Oh, definitely. And I want to hear more stories about our neighbours. I told you, Annie, I'm no gossip. Although I suppose I could change the names to protect. At the third stroke, it will be 8.55 precisely. The guilty. Eh, hey, you forgot the third bip. <laughs> I did not. It was that Frank Nugent from down the flats, Marjorie's lad. I heard him telling his mate that when his mum goes out, he likes to phone that posh bird and time his strokes with hers if you catch my drift. No, that's disgusting. His mum had tan his backside if she knew. Aye, so I always cut him off before the end. That'll teach him. You should tell him. Instead of the time, say, hey, 
Frank, does your mum know what you're spending her coupon money on? (laughs) Nay, Annie, got to keep professional. Although I have to admit, I did slip once and give somebody a bit of a verbal warning. Really? Come on, spill. It were years ago. Let's just say it involved my Billy, that blousy tart from the chippy, and what else might get battered if she didn't stop giving him extra scraps? <laughs> I wouldn't want to take you on over a deep fat fry, Jessie Maidley. Quite right, too. Anyhow, I need a brew. My throat's as dry as the cuttlefish I give our budgie. Put kettle on, Annie. Already? I'm sure there's a while to go to our break. What time is it? Ooh, not a clue. I forgot to put my watch on. At the third stroke, it will be third stroke. At the third stroke, it will be third stroke. At the third stroke, it will be That was like pretty decent. Clever, eh? The speaking clock. Sick. I think there's one here that I remember my mum talking about. I spied it last night. Oh, here it is. Day out. No idea what it's about, but let's have a listen. Day out. Written by Paulette Anderson. Performed by Denise Barry. I can't believe I am doing this, or that I am here. I'm sitting on the front at Landudno, on a bench looking out to sea with my cousin by my side. A cousin who, up until last week, I hadn't spoken to for the last three years. Last week she called me to this very bench, and I had agreed to meet her here. It's where we used to play as children and came to walk with our parents on a Sunday. I had watched her walk down the prom and take her seat beside me. She looked older, I thought. I suppose I did too, but hopefully not so haggard. It had taken quite a bit on my part to do this, still furious as I was with her for what she had done three years ago. She had looked at me and sat and fidgeted at my side. I did mean to come, she'd said, referring to the episode that had come between us. But to tell me the night before we went was a bit short notice, I'd said, even by your standards. I know, she said. So she had left the sentence hanging in the air. So what then, I said. What could have been so important as to let your supposed closest cousin down at the last minute for a holiday we had planned for a year? She'd picked up a shell from the ground and traced its outline with her finger. I was too ashamed to tell you about my problem, she'd said quietly, looking at the shell. Problem, I'd repeated. What? Were you ill or something? And anyway, why didn't you explain, instead of leaving me wondering and saying you just didn't want to come? I had tried unsuccessfully to contain my disdain. Gambling, she said quietly. I had been gambling online for ages. That's how I'd got the money to go in the first place. She paused and looked away from me. That day I'd tried for the big prize. It would have solved all my problems and I would have been able to have paid for you too. But I lost everything. Since then... I've been trying to get my life back together. You know, getting help and everything. I am better now. Well, getting there. I am so sorry. We had sat side by side, her waiting for my response, me searching for the words. The sun glinted on the water and the scene was all but idyllic. Oh, God, I thought. How judgmental I had been. My holiday had been ruined, and that is all I had thought of instead of trying to help her through her difficulties. I wish you'd have felt you could have told me, I finally said. Please forgive me for shutting you out of my life when you needed me most. So we made up. 
And now we are on a day out in our old hometown, revisiting all our old haunts. Oh, it's not been easy. We have had to build a few bridges and fill in a few gaps, but we are well on the way. I looked across at her. Fancy an ice cream? Look, the Punch and Judy man is still there. Shall we wander down? Great idea, she smiled, and after a pause, Do you think you could ever go on holiday with me again? She asked sheepishly. Of course, I replied. But perhaps not to Vegas, eh? I don't know why they didn't like go to Alton Towers. Josh, mate, don't be a dipstick all your life. Take a day off. Ha ha. Hilarious, not. Now, this is a bit of, like, culture for you. I think it's like a sort of poem. Want to hear it? Like, have we got time? I could stay for ages longer. But we should shoot, I suppose. Yeah, mate. Sneaking out two nights in a row. My mum's daft, but she's not that daft. What's that? Josh, that better not be your phone. Oh, no. It's me mum. Like, not cool. I Would. Written by Catherine Lamb. Performed by Paulette Anderson. I would have danced through raging fire for you, but you never lit the flame. I would have scored a goal at Wembley, but you wouldn't play the game. I would have scaled Mount Kilimanjaro, but you didn't like the height. I'd have bitten Mike Tyson's earlobe off, but you wouldn't even fight. I would have abseiled down the Eiffel Tower, but you didn't like the thrill. I would have ridden on the big one, but you said it made you ill. I would have given you a kidney. You wouldn't have to beg. Donated every drop of blood, but you were rhesus neg. I'd have been faithful, kind and loyal, like a golden Labrador. I would have sailed the seven seas with you, but you wouldn't leave the shore. I would have walked on fiery coals for you, but you doused them with cold water. I'd have kept my marriage vows intact, like a married person ought to. I would have studied the Karma Sutra, even page 83, but the only position you were willing to try didn't require me. I would have baked a hundred souffles, but rich food made you sick. I would have lit a thousand candles, but I just got on your wick. I would have dived the deepest ocean trench, but you always hated fish. I'd have thrown three coins in the Trevi fountain, but I was never what you'd wish. I would have tangoed, waltzed and cha-cha-charred, but you didn't like to dance. I would have grown old and grey with you, but I didn't get the chance. I would have laid down my life for you, but you threw that in the bin. So when they called to demand the ransom, I said I wasn't in. You have been listening to Davenham Radio Players, live from lockdown, episode three. Written and recorded by members of Davenham Players. The four-episode series is a collaboration with, and inspired by, Davenham Theatre's Writers Group, who meet with Flick on the second or third Thursday of each month. This project was produced by me, Tom Barry. I would like to thank Dee for her production support, Maggie for her marketing expertise, Flick for her practical and technical guidance, David for the music interludes, and to the cast for their incredible wealth of creativity, bravery and patience, mainly with me. 
and technology. And thank you to you for listening. For now, it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from them. Take care.